The ship, sent to the Antarctic to study climate change, has been stranded in the ice for 10 days. Attempts to rescue the passengers using icebreaker ships failed. Rescuers finally got through using a whopping great big helicopter that was landing on the supposedly very thin ice. They're all out, okay? So it looks to me like we're looking at global cooling. Forget this global warming. That's just my opinion. Yes, wouldn't it be nice if we didn't have to waste our time on scientific research? Just look at a video of a helicopter landing on sea ice and you've proved the Earth is cooling. No need for all them fancy thermometers in places all over the world that aren't America to monitor climate change. Or as Varney calls it, Climate change? If opinion was fact, of course, Varney would be absolutely right. But in the real world, we rely on the painstaking process of measuring and comparing measurements over time and calculating trends. And in a minute, we'll see how Varney's opinion matches actual measurement. First, I want to quickly revisit a video I posted last year explaining why scientists have concluded for over a century that CO2 drives global temperature. And I had a challenge for the citizen scientists who want to avoid that obvious inference at all costs. Try to address the evidence. Explain why you think the experiments showing the radiation absorption of CO2 are flawed and explain how the Earth thawed from its pre-Cambrian snowball, and explain why the Earth was much hotter than today during the Cambrian, even though solar output was much lower, and explain why there's a very good correlation between global temperatures and CO2 levels over the last 500 million years, and explain how the Earth warmed enough to emerge from recent glaciations, and explain why we've had 35 years of warming, even though solar irradiation has been lower. The video had over 88,000 hits at the time of writing and 104 thumbs down. So guess how many of those contrarians who disagreed with the science managed to explain all these observations? No, not five. That's right, zero. No one could come up with an alternative explanation for past climate change, nor could they show why CO2 is not the cause. What they seem to be saying is we can't explain all these things, but we definitely don't want it to be carbon dioxide. So we'll go with some mysterious force of nature we can't explain called ABCD. Anything but carbon dioxide. To be fair, one person did promise to rebut the evidence with a video, but of course he never made one. Now, I did ask very nicely for people to address the evidence presented in the video and avoid the usual internet rhetoric. Please don't respond with more predictable posts about how it's all an IPCC hoax, an attack scam, and computer models are wrong. But what do you think I got in response? Yes, of course. Bullshit. Fraud. Gravy train. Absolute bullshit. IPCC. Politically driven. This is a perfect example of what I said at the beginning of that video. When faced with evidence, the response from citizen scientists is never to look at it, or confront it, or challenge it, but simply to pretend it's not there. Most opted instead for the current internet myth that carbon dioxide's changed its properties in the last 18 years and no longer affects global temperature the way it has for the last 500 million years. The argument is that even though carbon dioxide levels have been going up for the last 17 or 18 or 15 or 20 years, wherever you want to draw your lines, temperatures have either not been going up as much as expected or even been going down. Either way, global warming stopped. The problem has always been finding the source of this myth, because most people, including those who repeated on this channel, never give their sources. So I was delighted when one of the most prodigious posters on my channel, Prairie Dog Res, or let's call him PDR, was more than willing to divulge his sources, starting with a Met Office report. Now, funnily enough, another prodigious poster posted elsewhere on my channel at exactly the same time. Both reappeared after a long absence. Funnier still, they both joined YouTube on exactly the same day. It's almost as if they're the same person. Anyway, it turned out that the Met Office report did not support the Earth has been cooling myth, and neither did all the other sources PDR tried, which is why it always pays to read these studies before citing them. In the end, it came down to just one set of data from Remote Sensing Systems, RSS. PDR justified this on the grounds that the satellite data is more accurate than ground station data. 
But of course UAH also uses satellite data and because of the difference in scale on the y-axis of these graphs, when you look at both satellite data sets, the average is clearly positive. So why is it one satellite data set is better than another? PDR wouldn't tell me. He just said he naturally chose to go with the data that shows cooling. But in science, cherry-picking is, of course, verboten. And if you do it to support an argument, you'll always be caught out when you finally reveal your sources. Having disposed of this cooling myth, what have atmospheric temperatures been doing over the last 15 years? Well, if you don't cherry-pick, but take all the data together, they haven't been falling, but the rate of increase has slowed down considerably compared to the 1990s. This is what's called the pause or hiatus. Remember, we're talking about atmospheric temperatures, which only account for about 10% of global warming. Most of the warming goes into the oceans. The Earth as a whole is still warming because researchers can measure how much energy is coming in and how much is going out, and the Earth is still receiving more energy than it's losing. It's just that the rise in atmospheric temperatures has slowed considerably over the last 15 years. But how is that possible if carbon dioxide levels have been rising in a more or less straight line? Shouldn't atmospheric temperatures do the same? Well, let's use an analogy with something that we can all agree causes warming, and that's the sun. Here's the story of a lovely lady. I think we can also agree that in the northern hemisphere, between the 1st of January and the 1st of July, the sun gets gradually higher in the sky and it shines for longer during the day. Now suppose a family who've been locked in a TV studio for 20 years escapes and moves to Denver in January. Since they've never experienced the changing seasons, they might well form a hypothesis that as the sun gets higher and the days get longer, temperatures in Denver ought to rise over the next six months. Let's say they call this their solar warming hypothesis. And they might also conclude that since the number of hours of daylight and the elevation of the sun follow a simple curve, then the rise in temperature should follow the same smooth curve. Pretty obvious, right? But as they monitored daytime temperatures, they noticed something odd. The temperature did go up at first, but then it suddenly went down. So the fathers and the sons came to the conclusion that the sun couldn't be the cause of warming after all, and I'm sure many of you would agree. And although the temperature did come back up, it then stayed flat for several weeks, even though the sun continued to get higher in the sky and shine for longer. The mothers and the daughters, however, began to suspect something else was going on. They checked monthly weather reports over the last 20 years and noticed that on a monthly basis at least, temperatures have always risen between January and July. And sure enough, pretty soon temperatures started rising once again. But a few weeks later, the boys again challenged the solar warming hypothesis because temperatures started falling once more. And again they argued that if the sun was responsible for warming and the sun was getting stronger, why were temperatures now falling? Now you may say, duh, but it's a good question that deserves an answer. Since we know in theory that the increasing power of the sun should cause temperatures to rise, and since the girls discovered that it's done that in the past, why doesn't the seasonal temperature rise follow growing insulation in a smooth curve? Why do we get all these dips and wobbles? Now I'd like to give the citizen scientists a few seconds to answer that one. OK, time's up, and I'm sure most of you get this. The answer is that increasing insulation is the driver of temperature over the longer term, in this case measured in months. But in the short term, over a matter of days, there are other factors that are trying to drive temperatures down. Carbon dioxide is also pushing up temperatures in the long term, but in this case the effect is much slower, a matter of decades and centuries. Now a lot of people ask, if you can't predict temperatures in the short term, how can you possibly predict temperatures in the long term? But in fact it's much easier to predict long-term trends than short-term fluctuations, for obvious reasons. In January, a meteorologist may not be able to predict if February will be warmer or colder, because all kinds of unknown short-term weather patterns will affect that prediction. But he can predict with confidence that it'll be warmer in May, and with even more confidence that it'll be much warmer in July. 
Because carbon dioxide works on a longer time scale, substitute one month for one decade, and we can see that every decade has been warmer than the previous one. The longer a period of time you have, whether it's months for seasonal forcing or decades for carbon dioxide forcing, the easier it is to make a prediction, because the effect of all these short-term variations gets less significant. And if that's hard to follow, let me explain it another way. Look at these background forcings as a kind of rising platform on which short-term influences play out. In the case of seasonal changes, these short-term influences are of course weather patterns that last a matter of days or weeks. In the case of greenhouse changes, they're things like the El Nino Southern Oscillation and solar output that last in cycles of years or decades. Let's imagine then a typical cyclical graph that bumps up and down without any major changes. Sometimes it goes up, sometimes down, and sometimes it's flat. Now let's introduce some imaginary background effect that's rising at a steady rate, in a straight line. Add the two together, and what do we get? Exactly what we see when a steady background increase in temperature is added to the ups and downs of a temperature graph. So the contrarians are right. We don't see a straight line rise in global temperature to match the straight line rise in CO2 any more than we see a straight line rise in temperature match seasonal insulation. But it's not enough to say we expect to see these long-term trends fluctuate. In a subject as important and controversial as climate change, researchers have to show exactly what these influences are and what effect they're having. And when we look at these short-term factors, it turns out they're all conspiring to send temperatures lower. For a start, solar output has been going down. Secondly, aerosol pollution has been on the rise, thanks to newly industrializing China and India. And following the strong El Nino event of 1998, there had been a series of strong La Nina years in which the oceans took up a lot of the heat that was in the atmosphere. So with all these factors conspiring to send atmospheric temperatures lower, why haven't they gone down? Atmospheric temperatures not only remain stubbornly high, they've even hit a string of record highs, Something must be keeping atmospheric temperatures up. So what is it? Once again, the obvious conclusion, since it's been driving long-term temperatures for at least 500 million years, is the increasing concentration of CO2. So my question for all those who adhere to the ideology of ABCD is, why not carbon dioxide? And if it's not carbon dioxide, then what is it? To scientists, there's no mystery about what's causing these record high temperatures. They expect more CO2 to warm the air because we know from laboratory experiments that it does. And the evidence shows that CO2 has been the main driver of climate for the last 500 million years. And researchers even predicted the recent rise in global temperature as far back as the 1950s. And they know that the Earth is still warming because more heat is coming in than is going out. What they don't understand is exactly where all this extra heat is going. Yes, of course, it's going into the oceans, because the oceans soak up about 90% of the increasing heat content of the Earth. And while there's been a pause in the steep rise of atmospheric temperatures, the oceans have continued to warm. The question is, exactly where in the oceans is this extra heat going? How is it circulating? And the other question that's currently a hot topic in climate science is how much influence aerosol pollution from China and India is having in mitigating the warming effects of CO2. One recent paper suggested their influence may be amplified because aerosols are being spread more in the northern hemisphere, which is where CO2 is concentrated. Since the armchair scientists don't want carbon dioxide to be the cause for ideological reasons, then why don't you guys have another crack at explaining all the phenomena outlined in my previous video without invoking the dreaded CO2? And have a go at answering the questions in this video too. And before you say galactic rays or cosmic rays or God or the Sun, please take a look at the notes at the end of this video and try again.